Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're still in Chapter 14 here. Uh, and in a previous video, we uh, derived or generated the uh, simple deposit expansion multiplier. It was simply 1 over uh, the required reserve ratio. And the value, the numeric value we came up with was 10. So that for each $1 deposit, that turned out to be end up supporting a total of $10 of, of money supply. Well, what we want to do here is be a little bit more realistic. And so we want to derive a more realistic money multiplier for the M1 money supply here. So again, we came up with this simple formula here, and we talked about, well, what happens if people decide to hold a uh, currency instead of depositing everything in a bank? And what happens if some banks hold excess reserves? In other words, reserves above and beyond that that are required. It turns out that our simple deposit uh, expansion multiplier here becomes a little bit more complex. It becomes this nasty thing right here. But it turns out that this equation really is not very complicated at all, and there's a great deal of intuition. And what we'll do is we'll save the intuition uh, mostly for in class. What I want to do here is to uh, uh, describe exactly where this equation comes from. So let's see if we can't do this. So. Here's what we want to see. We want to see what pieces and parts uh, are in the equation here. So the, the little m, that's going to stand for our money multiplier. Uh, C is just going to be the volume of currency and coins that are in circulation. So C is the coins and currency that we decide to hold. D is the volume of demand deposits. So in other words, the volume of our checking accounts. The required reserve ratio uh, is the same. That's just the fraction of, of deposits uh, that banks have to hold on reserve. So that's going to still be the same 10% as we saw before. Excess reserves are the reserves above and beyond, and that's important, above and beyond that are required to be held. And then, again, we have the, the ratio of currency to deposits. And, and the idea here that we want to get across is that we want to create an equation here that links the money supply with people's behavior and with the behavior of the central bank and also the behavior of, of regular banks as well. So how do we begin here? So let's start things off with several definitions. So our first definition is the definition of the M1 money supply, and that's something we should know uh, uh, pretty well by now. That's demand deposits and currency and coins in circulation. Uh, I'm going to ignore uh, traveler's checks, which are also officially counted in the M1 money supply because those are a very tiny fraction here and they are, they are not particularly important. And so we'll shorten this down to um, D for deposits, of course, and then C for currency, as we've already noted. And we do need one more definition here to get us started. We need what's called the monetary base. The monetary base are total reserves held by banks plus coins and currency in circulation. So notice that coins and currency in circulation shows up in both in, in both uh, definitions here. And so again, we'll shorten this down for convenience. And so we're going to let capital R stand for reserves that are held by banks. And what we'll discover in, in a few minutes is that uh, we will differentiate between reserves that banks have to hold, required to hold, and reserves that banks don't have to hold, that they hold in excess of what's required. And here's what we want to get to. We want to get to this important equation right here. So we want to link the monetary base over there on the right, reserves plus currency, to the total money supply as measured by M1. And we want to do that through that little m, that money multiplier that we want to invent, that we want to derive, that we want to somehow come up with. So how do we start to do this? Well, let's start with our definition of M1, deposits plus currency in circulation. And let's do a really simple math trick. Let's pull a, a D for deposits out of both of those terms. And so now we can say ah, M1 is equal to deposits times 1 plus the ratio of currency to deposits. Okay, and your first, your first thought is, oh gosh, I've just made the equation more complicated. I have, but only a very, by only a very slight amount, and it's done something important for us. Because notice that this term right here is just the numerator of that money multiplier that we want to invent, right? And so we've already somehow, with a very simple trick here, 
been able to get the numerator of our money multiplier. And the reason we want to do this trick or pull this trick is very intuitive. What we want to figure out is something like this, or to realize this idea. That that ratio, the ratio of currency and circulation to deposits, that's a decision that people like you and I make on a day-to-day -day basis. How much of our money do we hold in currency? How much of our money do we hold in the form of deposits? And it turns out that that decision is going to be important in terms of the total size of the money supply. So our actions affect the supply of money, and we want to be able to see that or have it be reflected in our decisions to hold currency and deposits. So that's our first trick here. And we're going to pull a couple other tricks as well. So now let's take our definition of the monetary base, total reserves plus currency in circulation. What we want to do is break total reserves into reserves that are required, banks have to hold, and excess reserves, again, that banks don't have to hold but decide to. All right? So I've just separated total reserves into its two components. Now what I can do is I can focus on required reserves and recognize how required reserves get determined. Well, required reserves, again, banks have to hold. Well, what's the total volume of reserves that banks have to hold? It's deposits in your checking account times whatever banks are required to hold as a fraction. So using our 10% figure and our fake, you know, say initial $1,000 deposit that we used in the, in the uh, previous video, that $1,000 deposit times 10%, that's 100. So required reserves for that particular bank would be 100. This figure, of course, is not the required reserves for a particular bank. It's the total reserves system-wide. So we will have you know, billions of dollars or trillions of dollars of deposits times 10% to give us total system-wide required reserves. All right, so now what we want to do here next is replace required reserves with this new term of required reserve ratio times deposits, times deposits, there we go. So now we have a new term or a new description for the monetary base. So this right here is required reserves. That's excess reserves. And that's currency in circulation. And now let's pull that same little trick we did just a minute ago. Let's pull the term of D out of each of those individual terms right there. So now the monetary base can be written like this. Demand deposits times the required reserves ratio plus the ratio of excess reserves to deposits plus the ratio of currency to deposits. Right? So notice now that this piece right here looks suspiciously like the denominator of the money multiplier. So notice we're gaining on it pretty quickly here. We've got a term that describes the numerator and now a term that describes the denominator. And again, I want to emphasize the reason we've done this is because now we have this new term here, the ratio of excess reserves to deposits. That represents bank behavior in terms of their decisions to hold excess reserves relative to the size of their deposits. And that behavior, as we'll see, just like our behavior with respect to the currency to deposit ratio will affect the money supply. So again, remember the idea here is to see how the behavior of the public, and in this case banks, affects the money supply process. Okay, now we're almost done here. We're, we're really gaining on it. So what we want to do now is solve this equation for D. So all I do is some little bit of simple algebra and I end up with that equation right there. So notice I've got this highlighted in red. So this D highlighted in red here will carry on to our next, our next trick. So again, we're almost done here. So now the angels are singing and the trumps are blaring. All we have to do is go back to this equation that we came up with earlier. Remember, all we did is start with the definition of the M1 money supply and we rearranged or remaneuvered the right side by just a little bit. So now we substitute out for that, and we substitute in 
this equation right here, and then we're all done. And so we get exactly what we started out to do. This thing right here, that is the M1 money multiplier. So we've now succeeded in what we started out to do. So what was the point of all of this? The whole point of all of this is to see how the behavior of the public, that's us, that's borrowers and depositors, banks, and then eventually the Fed all work to affect the money supply creation process. So again, we're going to save that for a later video. But here's what you might want to do at home to see if you understand this. Suppose, let's go back to this equation right here. So we have this money multiplier equation, this little m. What happens if we decide, or if banks decide to hold no excess reserves, in other words, only the required legal minimum, and households decide to hold no currency. I should probably have little dollars here, but you get the idea. What happens, this is what you want to ask yourself, what happens to the value of the money multiplier? What you want to be able to prove to yourself is that it reduces to our simple deposit expansion multiplier that we came up with earlier. And I'm done.